Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass Pianci, and I'm joined, as usual, by my partner in crime, Mr. Bennett Tomlin. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Cass? Uh, besides our normal crazy difficulties to start out every show, I'm doing great. We're joined by a special guest today, Frank Musi. He's going to be here to talk with us about El Salvador and their bonds. But uh, first, how are you? I'm doing well, Cass. Thank you. Good, good. It's a pleasure to have you here. You've been talking about El Salvador, the ramifications of their bond markets right now, the volcano bond. You've been talking about all of this stuff, kind of going into detail about it. We've had Travis Kimmel on to talk about bonds before. We've talked about the El Salvador Bitcoin bond before, but we've never like summarized what a bond is. So can we start out in the most basic step here? And can you just describe for our audience exactly what a bond is and how it works? All right. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'd be more than happy to. So governments have revenues and they have expenditures. So they collect tax money and then they spend the money doing financing, education, whatever. Sometimes their expenditures exceed their revenues, in which case they need to borrow the difference. And so what is the instrument that is used to borrow the difference? Typically, it is a bond. Governments don't go out and borrow money from banks. They issue bonds. So bonds are just pieces of paper that are sold for a certain amount of money, usually near par value or the notional value, the face value, near 100 cents on the dollar. And they have a coupon. They say every six months or every year, I'll pay you a certain amount of interest. And then I'll pay you back the full 100 cents on the dollar at the end of the life of the bond in five years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever. So really, it's just a piece of paper that says, I'm going to repay you this amount of principal on this date, and I'm going to make this number of interest payments on these other dates. That's all it is. When you take out a loan from a bank, the loan is, is more difficult to resell. But when you buy a bond, it has a very liquid secondary market, typically. So it's a, it's a more interesting instrument because it, it can be bought and sold relatively easily. So, so you can buy a company or a government's debt after it's been issued uh, uh, relatively easily. So, so all it is is, is is a type of debt, basically. That, that, that's a bond. If we're talking about countries taking out debt, you would presume that this is one of the safest forms of debt structuring out there. But it appears as though to me, there is generally a lot of volatility in bond markets, despite the fact that we're talking about issuers that are basically as big as it, it can possibly get. Different parts of the bond market are quite different. So it's difficult to generalize in like broad strokes about the bond market as if it were one thing. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. are some pockets of the bond market that trade like tech stocks, like truly. So when you're talking about Argentine bonds, when they're nearing default, or Venezuelan bonds, when they're nearing default, or countries that are in serious financial distress, those bonds can be extraordinarily volatile. You know, you can have bonds go down to 20 cents on the dollar with some bad news, and then they jump up to 45.50 as soon as some like right-wing candidate that's promising more fiscal austerity is like going up in the polls. In like let's say U.S. bond markets for the U.S. Treasury, there are no fluctuations in like willingness and capacity to pay. Really, the volatility that you get is because interest rates are rising and falling because of Federal Reserve monetary policy and so on. So that's what drives volatility in advanced economies. What? features have made it so the market is pricing in an increased likelihood of default for El Salvador? Why is their debt trading so far off the notional value? El Salvador's bonds, the debt contract is a New York law debt contract. So if it's defaulted, you have to come to New York and sue. Those bonds were trading at 90, 80, maybe 100 cents in the fall of last year, more or less. And ever since then, which coincides with the adoption of Bitcoin as legal tender, by the way, bonds have just been falling and falling and falling, 80 cents, 60 cents, 40 cents. And some of the bonds on the long end of the curve has fallen as low as 27 cents on the dollar. And essentially, that reflects the fear in emerging market fixed income markets that they are going to default, that sooner or later they are going to stop paying their debts. It doesn't mean that default is imminent that they're going to default this January or even January 2025. But it does indicate that absent a significant shift in macro fiscal policy, they will 
default sooner or later. And so why don't the bonds go to zero if they're going to stop paying them? That's because when bonds default, they're typically restructured. So the creditors get together, they sit around in a table with the issuer and they work something out. They say, okay, how much can you realistically pay? When can you pay it? There's a debt exchange and the situation is resolved. And so typically creditors can recover, you know, 40 cents on the dollar, 30 cents on the dollar, sometimes as much as 60 or 70 cents on the dollars. Uh, uh, And debt restructurings is a whole complex field. Sometimes there are restructurings that don't change change face value. They just push back when it's paid. So there's like a net present value haircut, but not a face value haircut. There are all sorts of debt restructurings can occur. But basically, markets are expecting that there will be a default and that there will be a restructuring. And so those restructuring scenarios are being priced into the debt now because everyone believes that they're going to happen in sometime in the next five years under current conditions, you know, on the way that El Salvador is going now. You're saying when countries default on their debt, which occurs semi-regularly, I guess. Nothing like what we experience in our personal lives. Like, we're not talking about when you don't pay your car loan payments, your car is repossessed. Or when you stop paying your home, your mortgage, they take your home and sell it, right? Even in the worst case scenario, basically their credit gets hit and they restructured the the debt. Is that, uh, am I getting that about right? So there's a huge difference between sovereign borrowers and regular old people like you and me, which is that sovereign borrowers have this thing called sovereign immunity. So you can't just go around seizing a sovereign nation's assets abroad to get them to pay their debt. When emerging market fixed income countries default, you you get these big vulture funds, these distressed debt investors that buy up the debt at bargain basement prices, and they try and bully sovereign nations into paying by attempting to seize different assets and so on. But that's a very difficult game to play, especially with a country like El Salvador that barely has any foreign assets at all. If you're an oil exporter and you know and you're staying owned oil company is owned by the government and they have tankers and they have pipelines and they have accounts receivable abroad and they have all these assets, then you can play ball. But in the case of El Salvador, that's just not it's just not there. They have sovereign immunity, and, and if they default, then that just means they'll have to enter lengthy restructuring negotiations, which which are costly, and they suck up a bunch of government bandwidth as the president gets busy doing all this stuff and communicating what's happening and so on. So it's annoying. El Salvador is a dollarized nation. How does that affect their sovereign debt and their ability to issue bonds and pay them? That is a hugely on-the-money question. Uh, It's very important, the fact that they're dollarized. So most developing countries have their own currency. That means that policymakers in the driver's seat, you know, handling the macro, have two main levers to pull to manage the macroeconomy. Fiscal policy, how much the government spends and taxes, and they have monetary policy, you know, what are interest rates, what's going on with the money supply. In a country that's dollarized, you only have fiscal policy. If you have an open capital account, your monetary policy is dictated by the United States Federal Reserve. So, you know, they raise interest rates whenever they want, and they don't consult you in San Salvador. When Bennett and Frank say dollarized, El Salvador literally uses U.S. dollars, and they cannot print their own money there. They cannot print any U.S. dollars. They don't have a Federal Reserve Bank there. They don't have a mint there. That means they also don't have a lender of last resort. So that if there is a financial crisis, if there is a banking crisis, if there's a run on the banks, you only have limited ammunition to counteract that. So whatever reserves you have in the local central bank, that's all there is. El Salvador has an $800 million bond due this January. And it has another $800 million bond due January 2025. And in between those two things, there are presidential elections. So in addition to those maturities that I just mentioned, those are the New York law bonds. There's a bunch of domestic debt that's also due. And there is some multilateral debt that is also due. So the government has to make a considerable amount of debt payments That invites the question, what happens if they don't pay? 
So what are the costs or the risks associated with sovereign default? As I've argued in the past, I have a Substack blog where I write about this. It's not difficult to imagine there being a panic where if you stop paying your foreign creditors, maybe people think, oh, maybe they're going to stop paying the domestic debt as well. If they stop paying the domestic debt, maybe I won't be able to withdraw my money from local banks. So maybe I want to pull out my money from local banks in El Salvador into cash, or maybe I want to send that money to the banks in the United States. Uh, And so it's easy to imagine a sovereign default snowballing into a financial crisis and a bank run. El Salvador Central Bank only has three and a half billion dollars in reserves. You can't do a 2008 and just fill the banks with liquidity and calm the panic. You really have limited ammunition. Debt default is is risky in most countries, but in a dollarized country in particular, it's even more risky. Is there is there times where a default m- makes the most sense for a country? Yeah, absolutely. I was referring to the costs of defaulting, but there are also the benefits of defaulting, which are that you don't have to pay all this debt and you can use the money that you saved for other things like socially important things like education, healthcare, security. Oftentimes when countries do end up declaring a default and calling creditors to the table to organize a restructuring, it's because it doesn't make sense to continue paying the debt because there's just no way they're going to be able to. I don't think El Salvador is at that place yet, to be clear. Uh, I think El Salvador can continue paying. It just needs to undertake a fiscal adjustment. It has a very large fiscal deficit. It spends like $9 billion a year. It rakes in like $7.5 billion a year. That's a $1.5 billion fiscal deficit. So what the country needs to do is to figure out a way to narrow that deficit to pre-pandemic levels. It's called fiscal consolidation, fiscal adjustment. Uh, There are all of these euphemisms for it, but basically it's raising taxes and cutting spending. Back when El Salvador was still in conversations with the IMF, one of the IMF's conditions for El Salvador was that they go on a program of that type of fiscal austerity. But then those negotiations with the IMF fell through, and it doesn't seem likely that El Salvador gets access to that kind of funding from the IMF anytime soon. There's a reason that I think El Salvador or other countries would be opposed to that kind of kind of deal. I mean, look, we're we're facing a recession right now and telling people, "Hey, start taxing your citizens more and cut all of your spending." That's generally not something you want to do under these circumstances, right? What you're saying is, wouldn't that be a textbook case of procyclical fiscal policy? Like, aren't you just making things worse at a time when you really can't afford to? I think that's a valid criticism. There's merit to that idea. But in the specific case of El Salvador, they widened the fiscal deficit substantially in the coronavirus pandemic, which I think was merited, but they haven't scaled back. Like the pandemic is largely over, you know, like people have been vaccinated. The variants that are coming in now are not as dangerous as they used to be. So there's no reason to keep having such an enormous fiscal deficit. In fact, it's like time to rein in the spending, like the emergency is over. So sure, like the the costs of of a fiscal adjustment program right now are significant, but the costs of not adjusting are also significant. Like it means that you're going to run into a chaotic debt default. Do you think Bitcoin has played a role? In an obvious sense, yes. And in a less obvious sense, also yes. The obvious thing is like the Bitcoin rollout cost a bunch of money. I've seen different numbers here and there, but if you, there's one article from El Faro, the local paper, that tallies all of the expenses as like $375 million between all in with everything. I don't know if that number is, is, is high. And then there are also the $50 million of unrealized losses on the president's alleged portfolio of Bitcoin investments. So that's $425 million. So that's like one and a half percentage points of GDP. So that's a lot of money. Is there still no proof that he's purchased any Bitcoin? I don't know. Uh, So all I've seen is the tweets. That's fucking insane. (laughs) So those are the known expenses. Then there are the the sort of difficult to measure, but equally real expenditures, which are that the Bitcoin implementation alienated the IMF. In these kinds of situations of macro fiscal distress, they can be an important ally for two reasons. One, they loan you a bunch of money 
at a low interest rate. And the other thing that they do is that because you have a program that's sponsored by the International Monetary Fund, that gives financial markets a lot of confidence. So that makes your spreads in bond markets come down and it makes it cheaper to borrow from international financial markets if and when you're able to do so again. So alienating the IMF really has big costs. I know that the IMF's very politicized. People love to hate the IMF. I was a development economist uh, for five years. And what is the IMF? The IMF is the doctor that shows up when the patient is laying on the bed with all kinds of symptoms, very sick, and they do very nasty treatment that also hurts to try and fix you, to try and save you. So it's easy to hate on the doctor. But the, the, the reason why the doctor is there is because the country, you know, was had poor macro fiscal management for all these years and put itself in that position. There are a bunch of, you know, emerging market countries, developing countries that you, they don't even talk to the IMF because they don't need to because, you know, their macro fiscal house is perfectly in order. After El Salvador's deal in progress with the IMF collapsed due to their announcement of adopting Bitcoin as this compulsory tender, they then announced a billion-dollar Bitcoin bond that they were going to issue. Can you talk to us a little bit about the El Salvador Bitcoin bond that was announced? <laughs> Honestly, I'd rather not, but I will. Um, <laughs> so the whole thing was sort of absurd from start to finish. Well, what's the first thing you look at when the country is issuing a bond? It's like, what do they claim they're going to use the funds for? Usually, it's just to finance the budget, to pay for schools and policemen and so on. This bond was different. They were going to use half of the money to buy Bitcoin. So $500 million to buy Bitcoin, which is an incredibly risky and irresponsible thing to do with taxpayer money. I mean, we already saw Three Arrows Capital just spectacularly blow up because it was trading with a lot of leverage. So it's no different for a sovereign country. You know, there's a reason why countries don't take out debt to buy Apple stock, because maybe it turns out that the Apple stock is Enron stock and you're gonna lose a bunch of money. So what leverage does is it massively amplifies the upside and it massively amplifies the downside. So purchasing cryptocurrencies with leverage, is just extremely ill-advised. The other thing that they were going to do with the money was build out uh, renewable geothermal electric capacity slash fund a new city called Bitcoin City. It's a city that doesn't exist yet, but they were going to create it. So $500 million was going to be destined to these things. It's unclear if it's remotely near enough money to build a whole city. No, and not. that's a polite way of saying it. Isn't. It, it costs <laughs> a <laughs> no. <laughs> no, obviously not. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's funny and whatnot. But the important point is it was also absurd because as I keep saying, El Salvador needs to undertake a fiscal adjustment. They cannot afford to be spending on half-baked, non-essential projects that are like number 67 on the priority list. They really have to allocate their scarce budgetary resources in the most efficient and impactful ways. And spending it on these projects is just not a way to do that at all. From what I recall, they immediately said that the bond was oversubscribed, that everyone wanted in on this. Meanwhile, they're working with Bitfinex to do this bond. They're listing it on the Liquid Network. All of this stuff in terms of it being able to be purchased by a lot of people was absurd and not true. So then COVID happens, they delay the bond, and then even though the bond is oversubscribed, they delayed it again. So they've delayed it twice now. And from what I can tell, it's possible this bond just doesn't even ever happen. I mean, there's just so much of it that is unusual, to put it in the most polite terms. So typically, when a bond is sold, you have a prospectus, an offering circular. There's these long legal documents that have all of these terms and conditions. What currency is the bond denominated in? What are the events of default? So like what triggers the default? What remedies are there? What are the, uh, the clauses and the covenants? And so it's just like endless legal documentation for any one of these bonds. Well. The Volcano Bond 
didn't have a prospectus. It also didn't have a white paper. It didn't have a website. It didn't have anything. That was just crazy. I mean, Bitfinex being the issuer, also crazy. Bitfinex is banned in the United States of America. And a large amount of the trading activity and the money and the people with the deepest pockets in crypto are all in the US. So how are you going to sell a billion dollar bond if the US market is just shut off? Most people know of Lightning. Lightning Network is kind of like this peer-to-peer, -peer, but you have to have an open channel and you have to fund your channel to pass money from one person to another. It's kind of stupid, but all the Bitcoin people really, really love Lightning. And Bennett also said it was cool. Never forget, Bennett. Bennett said Lightning Network was cool. Anyway, I still this concept stand by of it. Yeah, don't. Anyway, cool. um, Liquid, <laughs> Liquid Network is even stupider in a sense in that it was like, a group of the most trusted cryptocurrency exchanges working together to allow people to send, essentially send money through this network of ex trusted exchanges. Trusted being Kraken, Bitfinex, like, you know, not the best people in the entire world. And yeah, obviously it's not widely used because anyone who's a cryptocurrency advocate is like, well, this is stupid. We're trusting the worst actors in the space. And anyone who isn't a crypto advocate is saying, well, this is stupid. We're trusting the worst actors in finance. So either way, they've kind of run both sides out of this thing. And of course, that's where they're going to offer this bond, right? Why not? <laughs> but there's more. All of El Salvador's bonds, the, the euro bonds, the foreign bonds, they are New York law debt contracts. So they're issued in the city of New York. So if there is a debt default, you get to argue in front of a New York judge to restructure the obligation. These volcano bonds were not going to be New York law debt instruments because to issue a debt in New York, you need a prospectus. And as I said earlier, they never had a prospectus. They never had any documentation whatsoever. So that led me to conclude that this was going to be a local law debt instrument. That means it was going to be governed by local El Salvador law, which means that if there are issues, if there's non-payment, if there's a default, etc., you have to go argue before a judge in El Salvador to sort it out, to try and recover your investment. Obviously, that's you know, not a great prospect because judiciary independence in El Salvador has been weakened significantly in the last two years. A number of Supreme Court justices were replaced in May of 2021, if I remember correctly. So the court was packed. That really increases the risk profile of the instrument, because if there is a default, then you, you, you can't sue in New York. You have to sue in San Salvador. And maybe they'll treat you well, but like maybe they won't. You, it's just an added layer of risk. There's another thing for the volcano bond that was also very unusual, which is that the Republic of El Salvador was going to issue the bonds. But then there was this fascinating piece of reporting from the Financial Times that said that the state-owned energy company, La Geo, was going to be the issuer. A change of issuer is a big deal. So for me, this was like, what on earth is going on? So I started researching, who is this company, La Geo? They sell 22% of the electricity in El Salvador. So not even like 80%. They're small within El Salvador. They have like a $750 million balance sheet, if I remember correctly. So they were going to more than double that with the issuance of the Volcano Bond. They had like $200, $250 million in long-term debt. They were going to like sex tuple that with the issuance of the volcano bond. They have $135 million in revenue last year. So the volcano bond was a billion dollars, 6.5% coupon, $65 million in annual interest expenses. So they were going to saddle that electric company with $65 million of interest expenses on $135 million in revenue. I mean, the whole thing is, is, is like totally nuts. So unsurprisingly, they walked that back a few weeks later. It's just like there were so many odd things with this issuance, uh, the use of funds, the the lack of documentation, the fact that it was going to be Bitfinex, the fact that it was going to be local law, having La Geo, this like unknown state-owned enterprise be the issuer. That doesn't even touch on the idea that we already mentioned again of like, oh, $500 million for a city. You know, it costs like $30 million to build a, a, a single hotel, right? Like, what the fuck are you talking about? What the actual fuck are you talking about? There's no way this works at all. Even functionally, this thing is, is broken on Every single level, the way it's structured now is insane.
it's highly unusual and in my opinion it's very unlikely that it will ever work in anything resembling this kind of format which is why essentially it's dead every now and then the finance minister says that it's alive and that they're working on it and so on and people have asked me why you know why would the finance minister say that you know he's a political appointee he serves the president and the, the official party line is that this thing is alive so he'll keep saying that it's alive it doesn't mean that it is though <laughs> so the IMF deal fell through. The volcano bond is dead. But recently there was announced in the open a proposal for El Salvador to repurchase some of their debts and to kind of do that kind of restructuring in the open. What does that look like and what are the ramifications of that? So that was a really interesting and unexpected announcement. I have to say it caught me by surprise. Um... I think it's important for several reasons. You know, a sovereign debt analyst, when you're looking at a country, you're looking at two things for the probability of repayment. One is ability to pay. So what's the government's capacity to actually pay? And the second thing, which is sort of orthogonal, but not always, willingness to pay. Does the government want to keep paying the debt? With this announcement, I think that they confirmed willingness to pay in a way that they hadn't before. So people are thinking, okay, the government, at least for now, really genuinely wants to keep paying the debt. So the likelihood of a default in 2023, so next January, I think has fallen significantly. On capacity to pay, nothing has changed because the country still has the short-term financing options that it had before. In the long term, it hasn't done a fiscal adjustment. It hasn't raise tax revenue or cut expenditures. So long-term bonds are still trading more or less where they were before. There are two relevant bonds in this announcement. The 2023 bond, $800 million that matures in January, and then there's an $800 million bond that matures in January of 2025. And so they offered to repurchase those bonds in the secondary market at whatever the market price is at the time. So before this repurchase announcement, the 2023 bonds were trading at like 75 cents on the dollar, and they jumped up to like 88 cents on the dollar. And the 2025 bonds were trading at like 35 cents on the dollar, and they jumped up to 50 cents on the dollar. So, like, what is the rationale behind a debt repurchase? Why is the government trying to do it? Because suppose they are able to buy back all of the 2023 bonds for 88 cents. They're going to save themselves 12 cents per bond, plus, since they're buying them back six months before maturity, half of a coupon. So, like, half of 7.75, so 3.875. So, they're going to they're gonna save themselves 12 cents in principle plus 3.875 in coupon. By buying the bonds back early for lower than face value, they're saving themselves some money. And with the 2025 bond, if they're able to buy those back for 50 cents on the dollar, they're really wiping out a lot of debt and a lot of interest payments. So that's the rationale. With the debt repurchase, there are all kinds of super interesting dynamics. It's a strategic game. So the choices that every stakeholder makes impacts the payoffs that the other stakeholders make. So, so in a very stylized sense, there are three players in this game. There's one group of bondholders, a second group of bondholders, and then there's the government. So as a bondholder, suppose that all three of us were bondholders of the 23 note. What we would want is for everyone else to tender their 2023 notes and for us to keep ours and hold to maturity. Because if everyone else tenders their 2023 notes, that reduces the risk of default in 2023 dramatically, and we can get our 100 cents on the dollar in six months plus the half coupon payment. And then the government also has to play a game here, which is very interesting. It's a game that they haven't been playing so far, and the game is as follows. The government, I would expect to play hardball. They want to play up 
default risk. They want to say, listen, if this debt restructuring doesn't go according to plan, if not enough bonds are tendered and the price is too high, then maybe we won't be able to repay the debt. You know, it's not uncommon in these negotiations for the government to bluff a little bit, to play up default fears because they want more bondholders to tender their bonds, and they want them to tender their bonds at a lower price to achieve the largest savings for taxpayers. So I wouldn't be surprised if in the coming weeks and so on, the government starts playing this game a little bit. Although the announcements have been so strong about willingness to pay and capacity to pay and so on, that it's unclear that this bluff could even work. My understanding was that often when countries decide to do this kind of debt repurchase, it's done through an entity besides the state, like someone else to keep it somewhat more private to avoid affecting the price you end up having to repurchase the debt at? How does them making this announcement publicly really affect the dynamics here and change the game that's being played? So the that is another modality of debt repurchase. I can't remember what the formal name of it is, but like a, an informal name, you could call it like a stealth debt repurchase. It's like you you sign a non-disclosure agreement with with Bank of America or Merrill Lynch or whoever. You essentially give them a bunch of money and ask them to repurchase debt on your behalf for as low a price as they can. So there's a trade-off there, which is that if there's a big buyer scooping up bonds for cheap, that will raise their price. It's difficult to access a large quantity of bonds if you do it in a stealth way like this. So these kinds of undercover repurchase operations happen, and the government collaborates, again, by spooking people into selling their bonds. You make these statements that are a bit wishy-washy about willingness to pay. You make statements that are wishy-washy about capacity to pay. Sometimes you outright signal that the debt is, you know, illegitimate or that maybe you're going to repudiate it or that maybe you're going to. So these things can happen, but it's not what El Salvador is doing now. El Salvador is being more upfront about it. I think to a certain extent, it makes sense because talk is cheap. And so they can say that they're going to pay and they can say that they have the resources and so on, but a lot of people just don't believe them. And so they're going to want to tender their bonds, I think. There's a an intercreditor equity issue here. I know that sounds like gobbledygook, but there are some bondholders that hold short-term bonds, 2023, 2025s. And then there are some bondholders that hold, you know, the 2050s, the 2052s, the 2038s, or I don't even know which ones there are. Some of those longer-term bondholders might be upset, might not like this operation because the country has scarce resources, which I haven't talked about. It has the the special drawing rights from the IMF that are at the central bank. They're going to use part of them to fund this debt repurchase. They have some domestic financing options. You know, they could stuff domestic debt into the banks and the pension system. It's called financial repression. There are some foreign assets that they could maybe sell or privatize, but really there isn't that much uh, in terms of short-term financing that the country has. So it looks like with this operation, the country's going to blow a lot of those one-off short-term financing options paying the 2023 and the 2025 bonds, but it's not going to use that money to pay the 2050s or the 2030 whatevers. It will only use those resources for those long-term bonds to the extent that they fund the coupon payments. So if and when there is a default, there will be less resources in El Salvador to justify a higher recovery value for those long-term bondholders. So, so there are all kinds of interesting dynamics. I'm trying to fathom, like, in the case of a default, in the case of, like, the worst-case scenario, who are the main counterparties there? So it, that's a, an interesting and tricky question. So usually... You know, there are a bunch of countries that issue debts in dollars like El Salvador does. You know, in the developing world, it's a totally common practice. And those bonds are typically bought up by emerging markets, fixed income funds. So these are funds where wealthy people put their money and they achieve a yield that's better than the, what the U.S. Treasury pays. Of course, it's more risky, but it also pays more. So there are a lot of pension funds that put their money into these instruments. How However, the losses from the decline in price of these bonds might have already accrued to these funds if they sold already. And who are the buyers? When a country's credit really goes down the drain and their bonds start trading at distressed levels or default levels, 30 cents on the dollar, 
sometimes vulture funds buy the debt, uh, distressed debt investors. It's a whole type of, of investor. So maybe the bonds, a uh, significant share of bonds are already held by distressed debt investors, but we really don't know. Do you have any thoughts on how the domestic political situation in El Salvador affects this potential debt restructuring and just in general the fiscal situation in El Salvador? I, I have some hunches. President Bukele is extraordinarily popular. That's just a fact. He polls, you know, 80% approval rating, sometimes even higher. He is very skilled at like public relations and tweeting and all this. Are, are any of these, by the way, are there any of these polls that list 80, 90, 95% approval, are they independent polls or are they government funded? I don't know definitively, but I'm pretty sure they're broadly accurate. I don't think it's the case that Bukele is 30% popular and he's claiming he's 80. Like maybe it's 75 and not 80, or maybe there's a little bias there. Right, but the right, point is right. he's he's genuinely is very popular. So I think that he will have the political capital to undertake a fiscal adjustment. Fiscal adjustments are typically very unpopular, but I think that he may have the capital to do it. I think the million dollar question is, does he want to do a fiscal adjustment? Like, will he? My sense of the president is that he's very concerned with security policy, with like reducing homicides, and he has this sort of Tyrion Lannister security policy. So he's very focused on that, and he's very focused on like public image, crypto, staying in the news, and so on. So those in my sort of, I'm no political scientist, but my sense is that those are the two things that he's concerned about. He doesn't really have deep convictions about the economy or like what would be a good idea to do right now. He may stumble into the need for a fiscal adjustment and he may just have enough political capital to do it. This has been part of my tension with El Salvador for a while is that like they are clearly in need of like this fiscal adjustment. They need to cut their spending if they want to actually continue paying down these bonds they have issued. Externally, they keep communicating these asinine projects. We're going to build a city on this volcano. We're going to buy all these bitcoins or whatever. And then internally, like Bukele's entire thing is safety and security. But even like the internal police force for El Salvador has had issues getting like equipment and getting paid. And like they like go a bunch of zoo workers from like El Salvador's national zoos and stuff internally to like try to cut costs and stuff. There's this I can't figure out what's going on because they (laughs) because like the public communications are all we're paying everything. Everything's being paid. Everything is fine. But then like the head of the police union is like one percent of our radios work. All of our people are using their cell phones because the radios we're getting aren't working. And so it has been difficult for me to figure out what their actual situation is and how like Bukele's safety, security, martial law is going to end up interfacing with the fact that eventually he runs out of money, which isn't really a question. It's just, I can't figure (laughs) out what's going on. (laughs) I don't know what he's going to end up doing. Um, his, His team always invokes the metaphor of Singapore which is like a small country that's super well run and highly functional. And so it's like an aspirational country peer that they have. Also authoritarian. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, (laughs) evidently. But it's unclear that they'll be able to get anywhere closer to that if you don't get the macroeconomics right. I mean, having sound macro is a necessary but not sufficient condition for national development. I mean, the first step for national development is having proper macro fiscal management and macroeconomic management. That doesn't guarantee anything, but it's a necessary stepping stone for to get other things right to eventually develop. Because, I mean, one thing, we haven't talked about it here, but like, what's the broader story of El Salvador? Salvador's economy, it's a story of stagnation. After the Civil War ended in the early 90s, they had a new textile sector that popped up. That was an engine for growth for about a decade or or not even. And since then, economic growth has really been anemic. Uh, Living standards have not caught up with the developed world. So El Salvador needs to find a way to jumpstart economic growth, to like get GDP per capita to grow at like six, seven, nine percent a year, you know, something big, something, you know, it needs a game changer. But if it's struggling to just get these basics right, 
right. You know, if markets widely think that it's going to default, uh, then it, it's just not going to happen. You see it pretty often when these authoritarian dictators really love the idea of Singapore because Singapore, like, ultimately is the only country that I can think of, I guess, China to a degree at this point. But, like, this guy came in. He was a straight-up dictator. Yusuf Ishak was his name. And this dude, he dramatically changed Singapore for the better. Like, that's not to say all the things he did were good and justified, but Singapore was, like, not some hyper-developed, beautiful, wonderful place when he first started being prime minister dictator. And it has become renowned as being ultimately beautiful. Everybody's rich. He did a 180 degree turnaround on the economy, on the way everyone thought about Singapore. And so Naib Bukele, other dictators throughout the world look up to that kind of ability and go, I could do that. And the reality is it's such a different story in almost everywhere else in the world. And uh, yeah, I highly, highly doubt it. It doesn't seem like he's sophisticated enough to understand the economic issues and distress he is causing in general. Um, but on that note, Frank, is there anything else you would like to add about this? Maybe just a point about Bitcoin adoption in general. So if you think about El Salvador's economy, the issues that plague that economy are essentially orthogonal to Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has nothing to do with the true economic problems of that country. So what are the true economic problems of that country? You have low growth, therefore you generate few jobs, therefore you have crime and migration because there are a lot of people that are unemployed. As a result, you have low investment. So I've mentioned five things already, and all of those things mutually reinforce each other in this very stubborn and difficult to crack equilibrium. This is like a very well-diagnosed economy. Low investment, high debt, high deficits, low growth, migration, etc. All of these things mutually reinforce each other, and they give you this like terrible equilibrium that's very hard to break out of. When I saw that the country was adopting Bitcoin in September 2021, what I thought is this is just a big waste of the government's time and of the country's time. You know, like governments have limited bandwidth. They only have so many capable professionals that are working on solving problems. They only have so many quality legislators. You can only have so many priorities. And when you make this a flagship priority, it's just like you're missing the point. I mean, I'm not saying that that I have the answers about what El Salvador needs to do, but it certainly is not Bitcoin. You know, education, security, foreign direct investment, regulatory changes. I mean, I don't know. But one of those is at least more important than Bitcoin. So that's my take. It's been very frustrating. You know, as a development economist, what you want is for countries to grow, for living standards to rise, GDP per capita to go up. And the Bitcoin is just a costly diversion from all this, basically. One last question about Bitcoin adoption before we close this out is uh, I remember there being some reporting from, I believe it was El Faro, that suggested that one of the motivators behind El Salvador adopting Bitcoin was that they were going to create a new digital cologne that they were going to be able to print that would be effectively backed by the Bitcoin reserves at Bundesal. And that was how they were going to use the Bitcoin adoption to help improve their fiscal and monetary situation. Francis Coppola spoke about this exact thing on our show and said that her belief was with that bond and with all this Bitcoin purchasing, that the goal was eventually to get El Salvador de-dollarized and onto their own currency. That was what Francis said. I don't know how long ago that was, a year and a half ago. Yeah, well, I mean, de-dollarization is not a crazy idea. Uh, having your own national currency that you can print and having sovereign monetary policy is beneficial and can be advantageous. Uh, it allows you to manage the real exchange rate. It can make your export sectors more competitive. It can make your economy more responsive to external shocks. So in principle... There's nothing wrong with having your own sovereign currency. In fact, it's probably a good idea, uh, or it's arguably a good idea, at least. However, 
the transition is extremely delicate because obviously there will be skepticism. It's like I have actual US dollars in one hand and tomorrow I'm going to wake up and have something new that who knows what it even is. So these transitions have to be managed extremely carefully and there needs to be a lot of confidence in economic policymakers. So de-dollarization is something that's very easy to screw up. I mean, in principle, I'm not against it. I'm just very, very skeptical about implementation and design and, and I don't know why you would need crypto at all. Nice. Well, uh, thank you, Frank, for joining us. It's been a, a blast. And um, just want to quickly mention for everybody out there, I know we said that our 2072 Crypto Critics bond was oversubscribed. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're going to have to uh, restructure. <laughs> Things have been really difficult over here. I've made some really poor decisions with our reserves. Um, and I apologize, guys. Leave a like. Hopefully that will help us out in some way. I don't know how. I, we're screwed. We're totally screwed.